I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you.
I feel like I feel like in the in this season it's been there's been some things going on outside, but the spirit of God has been sweet. The spirit of God has been alive in this room, and when I when I'm just standing here and I hear your voices, I know that Jesus lives. I know that He's moving in this room. I know that whatever battle you're facing, whether it's internally, it's inside of you, or it's outside, I don't know what you're battling. I know that He's moving. And I just, God brought me this word, and I just want to deliver it. Somebody who was very intimate with the Lord, who had high favor with the Lord, was David. And man, he was, he was a king, and he had all things, and he could do all things. He could do whatever he wanted with the power that he was given. But he said, the one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, in this time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted above, up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, Lord, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. And this is what the Lord told him. Seek my face. And my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. And there's this song that's out right now. It's from Elevation Worship. And it said, what would you do? We know that the Spirit of God is here. But what would you do if Jesus Christ came walking through that door and he stood right here in his glory? What would you do? How would you praise? Would you praise differently than you were praising? Would you shout differently than you were shouting? Would you believe a little, a little more than you're believing? And I just began to imagine the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords beaten and bloody and and defeated but that's not the Jesus that I'm supposed to see that's not the one God wanted me to see today he said I wanted you to see the Jesus that rose from the grave the one that ran from the grave and after three days he rose and I don't want you to think about what you can see for a minute think about what Jesus sees and I'm thinking about him and he's he's praying to the uh, to God and he's saying Lord if there's another way I'm troubled there's a heaviness on me. There's a weight. I'm troubled, Lord, if there's another way. But he had to go through with it. And this is what it says in the message translation in Isaiah 53. Out of that terrible travail of soul, see Jesus, see him. This is what he sees in you. He'll see that it's worth it and be glad that he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, Jesus Christ will make many righteous ones. And he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I will reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and he did not flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest, he took on his shoulders the sin of the many, and he took up the cause of all the black sheep. Because what Jesus sees, what he still sees in the highest place, he sees you. And when he rose from that grave, he said, it was all worth it because I see you. See that Lord, see that Christ in glory because he's going to come back one day and you're not going to have a choice but to raise your hands. You're not going to have a choice but to shout with everything that's inside of you. So this morning, we're going to sing it one more time. And I want you to believe in your soul and see Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and know that he's worthy of it all. Give him the highest of praise this morning, church, and he will do mighty things.
Oh, Jesus, we come before you this morning, and we see you. We're seeking your face, God, and we see you. We see the glorious God, the glorious King of kings, Lord. And we praise you, Lord, in the highest place because we love you, because you see us as worthy, Lord. We will praise you all our days, God. It is just our one desire that we will live in the house of the Lord. God, that we will praise you, God, in this tabernacle with joy, despite what we see around us, despite what the enemy throws at us, God. We know that there's a strength that can only be found in you. There is a hope that can only be found in the Savior of the world. And you are worthy of it all. We rejoice in this day that you have given us, God. We give up ourselves, Lord, that we may have more of you, that we may have more of your spirit, God. Oh, we thank you, God, and we praise you. Keep your presence here with us, God, and just operate the way you would operate. We just seek you, God, and we love you. All in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I'll be, you can all be seated. Welcome to church this morning. Amen. So thankful that you're all here. So thankful that we can come together and sing and worship the King of Kings. And I just want you to all, I want us all, including myself, to just realize how blessed we are that we can do such. You know, in California, they're battling with the governor over whether they can shout and sing for the King of Kings and that same Lord of Lords. And there's a lot of things, and some of it I don't agree with, the the mandates and all this stuff. But man, I'm just so glad that we get to be here this morning. So if you are new this morning, we hope that you realize what we're about. We hope that you just realize that there's a, a love for God here and that we're just seeking his presence, and it is our absolute goal to help you know that same living God, to find freedom, to discover your purpose, and to ultimately make a difference. Uh, When you walked in, you should have received a Connect card. Uh, If you did not, just uh, find an usher. Uh, Find somebody that looks like they go here and just ask around, and we'll be happy to get you one. And if you'll return it to the front desk afterwards, we'll give you a gift. Who all here loves gifts? I love gifts. Hey, my birthday's this weekend, so uh, you guys just keep that in mind. Uh, Giving, giving, uh, tithing. Uh, Of course, everything that we do, uh, it operates from the body of Christ. Uh, We know that even without uh, us, God can do whatever he wants, but God uses us. He honors us because he loves us so, and he just gives us the opportunity to make that difference, to be generous, to give. And uh, there's some ways to do so. You can mail to our address here. You can give online. You can text to give. Or you can give the old-fashioned way and use one of these boxes on the back wall on your way out. Uh, Just drop off your your tithe there. Uh, Of course, CT Kids uh, is still starting. Uh, I believe it's still just second service. It's just the 11 o'clock service. But uh, if you decided to leave your kiddo at home or you've got them here and you still want them to be uh, served and and, uh, given the gospel, then we'll be happy to do so. And you can bring them back to second service, and we'll just be happy to have them. Um, of course, there's still no nursery, but uh, you can always, you're welcome to go back there and uh, nurse your little one, take care of them, and, and provide for them uh, in any way. We're happy to, to give you that facility. Uh, we have a, a men's fight club on August the 15th. We're getting there. We're approaching. I know we continue to, announcement, uh, to announce it, but it is coming up. And again, that's something we're just grateful that we can participate in because there is so much going on. Uh, but the Lord's operating in that, and uh, we're expecting great things. Uh, if you're a man and you're not signed up, get with us, get with Rick Bowles, uh, get with Mike York, and uh, we'll give you some more details, and uh, we want to see you there. Uh, and lastly, uh, Harold Riley uh, has has uh, contacted us. They're doing a 40-day revival. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a men's revival, but we're believing uh, God to just do wonderful things. Because like I said this morning, there's an intimate spirit uh, that God has blessed us with in this time. He's been so present. He's, he's been physical. And uh, we just want to continue to inhabit that and, and praise him and pray for, for mighty things to be done uh, in this community, in the world, to see people saved and uh, the lost found. And uh, so tonight at 730 at Legion Park, 
uh, they'll be doing, uh, uh, they'll have this night of revival. There'll be pray, uh, prayer, and uh, I'm sure Harold will give a, a good word, or somebody else will, and you'll be encouraged. Uh, bring a friend, bring a lawn chair, and uh, lastly, the women, you're involved too. Uh, you guys can meet at the the, uh, the the HR office, which is at Joseph Storage Bin, right across from Capitol Cinemas. Uh, so just thank you guys for being here this morning. We love you, and uh, we just hope you're encouraged. How about that? Better, better? Good, good. All right. They told me last week after I was done that there was like static throughout like the whole second service. And I'm like, well, that's, that's good to know. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, it's so good to see you. Wasn't the Lord just his presence good uh, this morning? I love that. I just love uh, the presence of God. I loved what you shared about David uh, Bryce. That was just, uh, just awesome. And uh, my heart beats like that as well. It's like, wow, if we could just, if we could just stay in His presence all the time, that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, but how many know we have a, a mission? We have a commission to uh, reach the world, and uh, you know, I, I believe that the Lord is calling us to be twenty-four-seven uh, Christians. That um, we are called to live the Christian life twenty-four-seven, and. Um, and I think that uh, as much as we have a heart like David, that we would like to stay in the church and just worship the Lord all the time, um, be nice. Everybody's nice here. Or most people are anyway. I mean, we're pretty nice around here. And it's, it's kind of easy to serve God here in this place, isn't it? And it's easy to feel the presence of the Lord here. But how many of you know we all have to leave here in a little while and we got to go back out there? And, um, and I think it's important that we, um, we, we have to stop compartmentalizing our Christianity. Um, for a long time, and I'm not saying this about you, I'm just saying the Americans in general over the last, I don't know how many years, have turned Christianity to, I go to church on Sunday. Uh, Christianity has been reduced to, in fact, if you ask someone, hey, are you a Christian? Many times their response is, oh, yeah, I go to Christ Tabernacle, or I go to Northside, or I go to First Baptist. And that's, that's not what they asked, is it? That's where you go on Sunday. But see, that's the thing is we have reduced Christianity to a building that we go to once a week or where we gather. And, and I'm just, I want you to know that Christianity was never designed to be a place you go once a week. Christianity was designed to be Christ in you, and he goes with you wherever you go. And he actually, instead of Christianity being compartmentalized, he infiltrates every aspect of our life. And so it's not just that. I mean, when you think about it, it's like, um, you know, when we compartmentalize things, it's I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a, I'm a husband, okay, I, I work here. Um, my kid goes to school here, you know, a kid could say, I'm a student, I'm a baseball player, and it's, you're, you're talking about the different compartments of their life, and then, oh yeah, and then I go to, I go to Christ's tab, I go to the tab on Sundays, right? Um, but that's not the way the Lord wants it. He wants it to be, uh, I'm a Christian father, I'm a Christian husband, uh, I'm a Christian businessman, I'm a, I'm a Christian student, I'm a Christian ball player, I'm a, I'm a Christian plumber, I'm a Christian electrician. It, in, it infiltrates every part of our life because I, I heard something this recently from John Maxwell and he was, he was talking about winning our world for Christ and he's in the business world all the time. He's in corporate America all the time, actually all over the world. And he just made this statement. He's like 50% of the people that, that don't come to church, basically 50% of the people out there aren't coming to church. They're not coming. They're not coming. And you see, the problem is our idea of evangelism is inviting people to church, right? Because that's our view of Christianity. Christianity is where I go. And so our idea, we have, we have simplified evangelism to just invite them to church. 
And so what, what has happened, especially in the 90s, is churches created these, what's, what many churches called seeker-sensitive churches. Anybody ever heard of that, seeker-sensitive? A seeker-sensitive church was what we want to do is we want to create church to a place where our total focus is on sinners. So we're going to build the whole service to reach lost people so that you can, so because people weren't evangelizing, so what they said is we're going to create Sunday to be so much so that you can bring a friend and they're going to feel totally comfortable there because everything is catered to them. So they would even take like secular music and then change the words and, you know, um, uh, instead of singing Sweet Home Alabama, it'd be the same song, but it's like, oh, let's all worship Jesus. You know, I mean, that's in it. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like this, right? And it's so it's, but that, that's, that's what a seeker sensitive. It was all about making the sinner feel comfortable so that we could share the gospel with the sinner. But listen, here, here's what got me is no matter how great you make Sunday morning, they're not coming. They're not coming. And so that challenge, it challenges us to let us know that our our job as Christians isn't to go out and invite the world to where we come on Sundays. Our job as Christians is to go out and share the gospel. Because a lot of people won't go to church, but they don't have anything against Jesus because they've never heard of Jesus. They don't even know who Jesus is anymore. They might have had a bad experience at a church, and so when we say, hey, would you come to church with me? They're thinking about that place their grandma took them when they were a kid, and they're like, no. I had to do that when I was a kid. I have no desire to come. And then you try to convince them, oh, no, our church is different. You know, you'll really like it. They, they don't want to. Listen, the only people that that works on, hey, do you want to come to church? The only people that works on are people who are going to other churches that their church is dead. And you tell them how great your church is, and they're like, well, yeah, my church is terrible. Oh, no, you need to come to our church. It works on them, but how many of you know that's not who we're trying to reach? We're trying to reach lost people. Right, And so in order to reach lost people, we have to enter their world, and, and it, it, it requires us to be 24-7 Christians, to be Christians at work, to be Christians at school, everywhere we go. And we actually see that in Daniel's life is that, again, remember, he was a governor. He wasn't a preacher. He worked in politics. He worked in a government setting, yet he... Uh, the scripture that really just stood out to me this week is it says that he served God continually. Verse 16. In fact, turn to Daniel 6, verse 16. And, and while you're turning there, while they get it on the screen, you know, I just thought about, you know, through the 90s, they went through the seeker sensitive church movement. Um, you know what I believe Sunday morning is for? I believe Sunday morning is for you, especially in these times. I believe Sunday morning is a time for believers to come together, to worship their God, to pray, to be equipped, to be encouraged, to go out and reach their world for Jesus, because we live in a tough time. It's kind of like, it's kind of like halftime huddle. You know, we're all in here together. This is a safe place. And, we, and if you're out there sharing the gospel and you're living in a crazy world, you need a place of refuge that you could come and, and, and do that. Now, at the same time, I also think that it's not just for us, and just like a family reunion, you know, think about when family gets together, just when family gets together, we're family, but every now and then someone brings a guest, and when you bring a guest to Thanksgiving, you don't change what you do, right, but you focus on the guest as well. You acknowledge, hey, we got a guest here. You know, we're, we're about to do this. You know, we ask you to join us. We're so glad that you're here. We got a place at the table for you. We make them feel so welcome, so loved, so part of the family, but we're still going to be the family. Does that make sense? And, and so instead of changing who we are to try to make, to, to be so focused on that, it's we make them so feel welcome. But, but what, imagine this. Imagine if we went out and you shared your faith with somebody and they received Jesus. You've never even brought up church. You just talked about Jesus. And then they give their life to Christ. And then, then now that now here's the next thing. Say, you know what? This, everything's going to be completely new for you. You know what? I've got something exciting. You're, you're now part of the family of God. Why don't you come with me this Sunday and get to re meet the rest of your family? You've got all kinds of brothers and sisters that you don't even know you had. 
And, and there's all these people that, that, that love you and care for you and want to help you on your walk. Why don't you come with me this Sunday and meet the rest of the family? See how that's different? You've already led them to Christ. Now they're wondering, oh, what do I do next? Well, the next thing you do, you get baptized. You, you, you become part. You're already part of the family. Now let's go meet them. It's, it's like, you know, as your family grows and, the, and a family should always be growing. You know, families should, you know, a healthy, healthy families grow. And everything that's healthy grows. And so as, as the church family grows, there will always be new people. There'll be somebody bringing a boy in, some young girl. Now she's 16, and all of a sudden she's introducing her new boyfriend. Or, or somebody just had a baby. Listen, that's, that's healthy, and the church just begins to grow. And, and they learn, and we help them along the way. But it requires us to be a 24-7 Christian. That's a long introduction, isn't it? i got to get going. Verse 16, so the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of lions. If y'all remember, um, last week we talked about this and, and how the, the king had, they had tricked the king into this, <clears throat> making this decree that if anyone worshiped any god other than him, uh, that they would be cast into the lion's den and we realized that Daniel couldn't even make it one day. And uh, the very first day, he went and prayed three times. So they immediately, that day, they throw him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, watch this, Your God, whom you serve, notice this word, say it, everybody, continually, he will deliver you. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel may not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and he spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Notice this, and this is, this is the first thing I want you to see is that Daniel served his God continually. And I think, you know, again, what we, I remember as a kid going to church and, and or going by the church and there was, this, there was this a retired gentleman and he was just always at the church. You know, and, and he was just, he'd be there, he'd be pulling weeds. He didn't work for the church. He just, he, he just loved the church. And so anytime you would go by there, he was there. It was almost like he lived there, and he would always find something to do. And I was like, well, that must be what it is to serve God continually. And we were all thankful for this, brother. But listen, can I just tell you, that's not what that means. It doesn't mean that, you know, yes, you serve in the church, you're an usher, you're a greeter, you're, you're a worship team member or whatever, but that's not to serve God continually. That's what you do on Sundays. To serve God continually is mean, means you take Jesus wherever you go. You take him to the marketplace. That's where he wants to go because Jesus loves lost people, right? He, he's concerned about those who aren't here yet. And so how, how do we... How do we do that? Well, we, we, that means he, in, he permeates through every part of our life. And so, so again, Daniel is now being thrown in the, the lion's den. But, but notice the king who loved Daniel, the king, spent, and he's an ungodly king. Remember, remember the decree he signed just when well, it was last week for us, but it was yesterday for them. He just signed a decree that you, the only person you could pray to was him. So how many of us would agree that this guy is not saved? If you're telling people the only person you can pray to is me, he's lost, right? He's lost his last year's Easter egg. I mean, this guy's lost. And, and so he's, he's, but he loves Daniel, and so he's, so he's so heartbroken that Daniel's in this place, and he was the cause of it because he got, he got tricked into that. But look at this. He spent the night fasting, and it says, notice these words, and his sleep went from him. Imagine this, that here's this king who has everything. He can't sleep. And while he's having a sleepless night, Daniel's in the lion's den using a lion for a pillow. Imagine that. You know, listen, you can be right. If you're in the will of God, you can have peace right in the midst of a storm while the rest of the world is, is anxious and, and, and which... Listen, be aware of that. Listen, we are living in the best time to evangelize that has ever existed. Because as Christians, I'm telling you, we have, Christ, uh, we, we have something that is, that is giving us peace in the middle of the storm while everybody around us is anxious. 
And, and if we'll open our eyes to what people are going through and realize the peace we have, then we can just look at people and say, oh, I wish you had the peace I have right now. I wish you had the faith I had right now. Learn that from John Maxwell. I'm going to post his message on our Facebook so everybody can see it. It's amazing. Verse 19 says, the king arose very early in the morning and he went in haste to the den of lions. And, and when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. And the king spoke to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve, what? Continually been able to deliver you from the lions. Notice again that this king was aware that Daniel was constantly serving God. Yet he still liked him and obviously it didn't hurt his job performance. He, he was like the only one in the, that was around the king that was serving this God, but the king still liked him because Daniel was still performing. Interesting. We can be a Christian on our jobs without turning everybody off. Because maybe Daniel wasn't going around talking about Jesus all the time, but it was just his character that people recognized that, that there was something different about it. You know you can speak the truth to people without using Scripture and verse? You know, you, you can throw out a proverb every now and then, and people just think you're the wisest person they met. And then, but if you say Proverbs 1 says this, then they're like, oh, he's quoting the Bible again. Just, just truth is truth, whether you give it the reference or not. Just, just bring truth to your workplace. Jesus was the greatest leader of all time. Verse Verse 21, Daniel again, he said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I, I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I've done nothing wrong before you. And the king was exceedingly glad for him. And he commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. As we talk about reaching the world for Christ, a lot of times I believe that we should share our testimony as we do that. We should, we should mix our testimony in and, and how, what God did for us. And there's probably some young people who are sitting here today and they're thinking, I don't even have a testimony. I mean, you drag me to church every weekend. I mean, I had not even got to sin good yet. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I hear these people and, you know, I was a drug addict and I was this and then, but God rescued me. And you're, you're hit, sitting here this morning thinking, I don't even have a good testimony. I mean, we've had people here who've tried to commit suicide and God save them. We have people that, that God's delivered them from, from drugs. We have people that have been through the hardest thing, who've lost children and all these things. And, and, and they've been through hell and back. And then we have some kids sitting here thinking, I don't have a testimony. You know why? You know, let me tell you something. You've got the best testimony of all. Because here's your testimony. That God shut the mouth of the lion. Amen. That's your testimony. That don't think the devil hasn't been after you, but you got a parent that's been praying for you that God shut the mouth of the lion. Don't let him get him. And that's, that's your testimony as when Satan wanted to devour you, when he wanted to take you out, you had some grandma or some aunt somewhere that was praying that, that the lion's mouth would be shut. Or when you fell, that, that the angel cushioned the fall. You don't even know how much your angels are working overtime on you. Because, because God has protected you because he's given his angels charge. I remember when David was a kid, I was working at a house, and uh, he was little. And from the time he was little, he was a tree climber. I mean, if you all have been around here for a while, you remember David was a kid. He'd be out in the front trees. He'd be way up, way up in the trees. And just if he saw a tree, he was climbing. Wherever we went, he was climbing a tree. And I took him to work with me one day. Becky wasn't there. I brought David. I don't remember how old he was, but he was little. And I'm working inside this house, remodeling this house. And, I, and all of a sudden, I hear David crying. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I run outside, and he's just sitting there, and he's crying on the ground. And, and I'm like, what happened? What happened? He said, I fell out of the tree. And I look up, and I said, how high were you? And he said, about half. <laughs> I mean, it's like half. Oh, my gosh. But, but can I tell you, he didn't have a... He didn't have a broken bone. He didn't, you know, listen, God gave his angels. They just kind of like, his angels are like ready to retire. I'm telling you that right now. They're just like, this kid is, is wearing us out. But, but I'm just telling you, you have a testimony. 
And the king, he gives the command, and they brought the men, verse 24, who had accused Daniel. And they cast them in the den of lions. Notice this. Their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces. Before they ever came to the bottom, before they ever hit the ground, the lions totally destroyed them. Do you see? That's, that's what the enemy wants to do to each of us. But notice how God protects. Notice how God keeps Notice what's going in our, on in our world right now and how all around us people are distraught, but how God has kept you in the middle of it. Listen, don't, don't take it for granted. How can we not share how God is keeping us when everybody around us is suffering? And then Darius wrote, I mean, this did it for him. Watch, watch this. And here, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see Darius's revelation of God. Now remember, yesterday he's having people pray to him. But notice the revelation of God that he has, and I, I, this probably is going to convict some of us because his revelation as a one-day-old Christian is better than a lot of Christians I know have been in church their whole life. And I'll be honest with you, it's better than some pastors that I know. But look at his revelation of God. He says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Now, number one, you can tell he's just barely saved because he thinks he can force people to serve God. And uh, how many know that doesn't work? But anyway, he's, he's trying. He, at least he has a heart that he wants to reach everybody. He's not just keeping it to himself. He says, I want every person. I'm king, and, and from here on, I make an order that you have to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. Notice he didn't even say it was his God. He hadn't even got to that place yet. He said, I don't really know him, but we're all going to worship Daniel's God. The only God he knew was that it's Daniel's God, and I tell you what, he's God, I'm not, we're going to worship him. Now notice what he said, for he is the living God. Can I just tell you that God is alive? That he's alive. He's not stuck between the the, in the pages of this book, he's not just stuck between the covers. He's not just, a, just something that was then and now he's not active anymore, but he's living. And he, he's interested in your daily life. He said he's steadfast forever. Isn't that good to know that a world that's shaking and when things are falling around us, that God is steadfast, that God, God's not freaking out in heaven right now? He's not worried about who's going to be elected He's not worried about COVID-19. He's steadfast. And though things may be crazy down here, it's just like, it's just like if you're on an airplane and if you've ever, you've ever taken off during a storm or when it's raining, raining and it's nasty outside, and you take off in an airplane and it's, it's just bumpy going up and it, the plane is shaking and you're just like kind of holding on. I get I get sick easy on those types of things so I'm just like oh Jesus help me and 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 so we're, we're going up and it's shaking but you know as soon as you get above the clouds everything's beautiful and everything's sunny and it's just smooth and and that's the way it is right now down here everything's crazy everything's shaky everything looks like a mess but you know God's perspective is like he sees things totally different and with God everything is steadfast forever and the king has this realization that his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Listen, every other kingdom will pass away. Kings and kingdoms will pass away. But listen, Jesus' kingdom will last, will never be destroyed. And his dominion will endure till the end. Look at verse 27. He, he delivers and he rescues. He works, now look at this, he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Do you believe that? Come on, that's what I said. There's, there's pastors who don't believe that. They believe that he delivers and he rescues, but they don't believe that he's still, oh, he might work signs and wonders in the heaven, but he's not doing that on earth anymore. Oh, fiddlesticks. Come on, how many of you know he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and he still works signs and wonders. I mean, I was talking to Becky this week. It's our anniversary, everybody, 28 years yesterday. So she has to be a saint after 28 years with me. But she was telling me this week that, um, that back when we had Josh Silverberg and his team come, y'all remember that back in, I think, February, praying for people and everything. And she, she had suffered such pain in her neck. 
and found out she had arthritis in her neck and just, we just woke up in pain. I mean, would be in tears uh, from the pain and just, um, and that, when that weekend when they were here, just some ladies gathered around her, prayed. I don't even know. You probably didn't know who it was, their names. You Maybe you did. I don't know. But uh, they, just, they just prayed over her. And, and she said this week, she said, you know, Troy, I haven't been to the chiropractor since February. She used to go like every week. I haven't been. Um, she's like, I haven't had a pain since, you know, not like that since then. I mean, she's married to me, so she's got a pain. But I mean, she said, you know, David used to suffer from migraines, like he'd have a headache every week. And I don't think you've had a migraine since then, have you, son, since February? Come on. Could, you know, God still does signs. Not only does he save us from our sins, but he still wants to do, he still works signs and wonders. Listen, we need to believe that, church, because if he'll do it here, how many know he'll do it where you work? God loves to show himself. And one of the things that Daniel said later on, I think it's the second to the last chapter, he said, you know, the people who know their God, who really know their God, not who compartmentalize Christianity, but those who are 24-7 Christians, those who know their God will be mighty and do exploits. They will do exploits. Awesome. The world needs to see people that are passionate for Jesus. And, and here's the thing. Again, he has this incredible revelation. But everything, and I want you to think about this, everything the king knew about God, everything, there was no Bible. There was no church to go to. There was no Google. Everything that he knew about God, he learned from watching and listening to this guy who worked in his kingdom. That's it. He'd never been to Sunday school. He'd never been to VBS. The only thing, this great revelation that he had about God all came from watching a 24-7 Christian. That's it. He didn't have a grandma that sit him down as a kid. Are you, are you seeing what I'm saying is that Daniel so lived his faith at work that the king has a revelation of God that pastors who go to seminary don't have. I mean, this is, this is amazing. And my question to us this morning is, if the only God that people see is what they see in you, what would God look like to them? Because can I help you? They're not reading the Bible, people. They're not reading the Bible. And listen, they don't teach the Bible in school anymore. So if, if they don't know about God, the only God that they can know about and see is, is the God you bring with you to school or to work or to your Facebook posts. Hmm. Let that sink in just for a minute. I mean, do they have a view that Jesus is a Republican or Jesus is a Democrat? I mean, just saying. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. So <laughs> Jesus is Jesus. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And it's, listen, I've always thought it would be so much better if Jesus would just send the angels down and, and he would use them to proclaim the gospel because I think they would do so much better. But instead, he uses us messed up people to declare and, and show people the works of God. And, and so do, does our life, and what my question is, is do, do our lives and our speech as we leave church make people hungry for God? You know, what I love about Daniel is he brought God to the marketplace. He was a 24-7 Christian. He served God Continually, and it, it affected his it, it affected every area of his life, and it should affect our marriage, it should affect our, our, our relationship at home. It it's not just when we walk in the church, it's how it's in the car ride home, everybody. It's in the car ride on vacation. You know, how about how would you like Jesus to come into that car on the way to vacation? I mean, it's just and, and here's what we see, and when we look at this situation, God was being glorified in this ungodly culture through Daniel, but, can I, but here's a wake-up call, but no one was being transformed. 
I mean, Daniel was representing God in a fantastic way. I mean, they had an understanding of who God was, but yet nobody's getting saved. The king didn't get saved until after the lion's den. And so maybe that should tell us something as Christians is that, you know what, God may be, God may be glorified through our lives just in how we live in this world. And we, you know, we go to church and we go out and we're good, we're good workers, we're good those things, and God can be glorified through that. But listen, if we aren't seeing the world transformed, if we see, aren't seeing people turn to Jesus, then God may have to change some things around a little bit so that we will get out of the church and go into the world and begin to share our faith. You know, that's what happened to the early church in the book of Acts. It was, you know, Jesus said, I want you to go to the whole what? world. I want you to go to the whole world, world, preach the gospel. I want you to start in Jerusalem, then go to Judea, which would have been the bigger region, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. I want you to go to the whole world. That was his last command. It's his command to us. I want you to go to everybody. Wherever you go, I want you to tell people about Jesus. Well, what happened is, is they had, things were thumping in Jerusalem where it started. I mean, the church is born, they go from 120 to all of a sudden there are thousands of people overnight. They've got a mega church, think about this, they got a mega church in Jerusalem. I mean, you might have Peter preaching one Sunday and then John the next. I mean, it, it is just like, it's the dream team, you know, they've got the presence of God, there's signs, wonders, miracles. It is awesome in Jerusalem, everybody. And, and, and they got so excited about what was going on in Jerusalem, they forgot that he wanted them to go to the rest of the world too. And they weren't going. And Jesus is like, I, you know, I love what you guys are doing there, but, but I, there's a whole lot of lost people that I want. My heart's for the ones who aren't here yet. And so he allows persecution to come to the church. He actually allows a guy to get killed. Y'all remember Stephen? Stephen was, was martyred. For his faith, and all of a sudden the church is like, oh, wait a minute, it's not easy to be a Christian anymore. Somebody just got killed, and it said, when after the persecution, this is Acts chapter 8, after the church was persecuted, it said the church began to scatter. Everybody began to go back to where they were from. It's like, I got to get out of Jerusalem. You know, I, we all moved here to be part of this church, but, but I'm, I'm out of here. But, but it says something, it says the apostles stayed there. But everybody, the church began to scatter through, guess where they went? Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And the Bible says this in Acts chapter 8. I think it's around verse 2, something like that. It said that, let me, let me find it real quick. It said, wherever they went, those who were scattered preached Christ. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Not the apostles. The church. And everywhere they went. And, and it, it wasn't that they were preaching Jesus on the street corner. It was just they became 24-7 Christians. That as they went, as they went, when it says they went everywhere preaching, it just the literal translation is as they went... They shared the gospel wherever they went. It just became part of their, of their life that if they were at a restaurant and, and they, they, they asked the waitress, said, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Really? Everything okay? Hey, we're getting ready to pray for our meal. Anything we can pray for you about today? I saw Brian Wright do that. I, I, I was like, man, that's the coolest thing. Hey, we're getting ready. We were, we, we were a bunch of guys sitting at a table and we're getting ready to eat. And he said, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our food. Is there anything we can pray for you about? Hey, that's slick right there. Come on, y'all need to take, that's, that's good, write that down. And, and, and she's like, well, actually, uh, you know, I, I'm not a Christian or I don't serve God, but I mean, yeah, I mean, my, my husband just lost his job. And hey, what's your husband's name? We're going to pray for him right now. We get up praying, you know, she's just standing at the table, just like, okay. Tears. You know how easy that is? But it's, it's being aware that, you know, versus, hey, you know, I'm not going to leave you a tip, <laughs> but here's a card to come to join our church, you know. You know how many know that's not going to work? 
I'll just, I'll just leave her a little invitation in the, you know, I'm going to give her a good tip and leave a card or whatever. You know, listen, how about we, we share Jesus instead of just to come to our church? Amazing. And so God allowed persecution to come because, because he, he wants to reach everybody. And he wants us to permeate every area of our region and the world to reach people for Jesus. And so, so listen, in order to win our world, listen, here, here you go. What do we have to do? First thing I want you to do, if you're taking notes, if you're not, take notes. So it's uh, first thing you need to do. We need to add value to people. Add value to people. You know, you can add value to people in your workplace just by your attitude. Let, let them see. Beck, Becky's working with some people. She, she, she works during the week, and, um, and she's working with some people. And she comes home every, every day, and she's like, I just love the girls I work with. You know, it's not because they're buying her lunch. It's not because they're doing these things. It's, she loves them because of their attitude. It's just, you know, you, know, you can either, you're either adding value to somebody or you're, you're either making a deposit or you're making a withdrawal. How I many you know? Some people, they just suck the life out of you. And it's just like, oh, you see them walking down the hall. And it's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Lord, help me, Jesus. And then there's other people that when you're with them, they just, they just add value because of their positive attitude, just the way that they are. Listen, if you'll just have, if you'll walk in the Spirit and you have the fruit of the Spirit, then that means you're full of love and joy. How many of y'all like to be around happy people? Like, like Tigger happy, like just come bouncing in the room. Hey, how's everybody doing? You know. just, just like that and, and, and full of joy. Listen, when you're like that, you're adding value to people around you. You know, when, I, when we started our food distribution, it, it was all we wanted to do was just add value to people's lives. That's it. And, and for the longest, and I remember back in the early days, we just started and, and um, we would be, you know, helping people with their food, and they're like, okay, what's the catch? What's the angle? They're like, no, we don't have no angle, no catch. We just want to bless you. No, but what do I have to do? No, you don't have to do anything. It's free. We just, God loves you. We love you. He's blessed us. We want to bless you. No strings attached. And we get to the car, and we say, hey, is there anything we can pray for you about? You know, how can I pray for you? No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Because they still think we've got an angle. Month after month after month, we're just giving food away, taking it to their cars, serving them, just, just loving on them. Hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? No, I'm good. Six, seven months, they, they start to realize we don't want anything from them. All we want is something for them. We just we want to bring value to your lives. And then after a while, it took a while, but then all of a sudden it was like the dam broke and we'd say, hey, you know, how can I pray for you? I'm going to pray for you. You may as well give me something to pray for you about. Well, my, my son's, his family is really wrecked right now. And he and his wife are having trouble. And if you want to pray for that, that'd be good. All right. What's your son's name? His name's Bob. Okay, let's pray for Bob right now. Put my arm around their shoulder. Can't do that in COVID right now. They'd freak out. But let's put my arm around their shoulder and say, oh, God, we're going to pray for Bob. God, we just, I just pray that you make yourself real to this family. God, I pray that you restore. God, you rescue. You restore. God, you're, a, you're, you're the one who delivers. And, oh, God, I pray that you just intervene in this situation and you bring healing to them and just save this marriage. God, make yourself real to them this week in their lives. You know what happened? I'd see them again next month. Pastor, pastor, can't wait to see me. You're not going to believe what happened. And man, it was like now all of a sudden everybody wants prayer. And we went from nobody wanting prayer to almost 90% of the people when you push their cart to their car. How can I pray for you? No, they start giving you a list. It's awesome. Because what, what happened is we earned the right by adding value to them. It's amazing. And then here's the second thing is add value to people, but here's the second thing is value people. Just, just let them know that they're valuable to you. You're, you're not just, they're not just a, a, a bother to you. They're, they're valuable to you. John Maxwell said this. He says, you don't have to be like people to reach them. In other words, we don't have to be like the world to reach them, but you do have to like people to reach them. If, you, if it comes across like you don't like them, can I just tell you they're never going to listen to you. 
But if they realize that you value them, you know, the king liked Daniel. You can tell that he liked him. He's like, I, I, I don't know about your God, but, but I like you. And, and by the way, Daniel brought value to him. When Daniel was in the kingdom, everything ran better. And that's why the king's about to promote him to the highest place in the land. He's like, I don't know about your religion. I don't know about your God. But this I know is whenever you're in control, I don't have to worry about anything. Because you're honest. You know, you get along with people. I mean, you're, you're just, everything was better with Daniel. He added value, but also he was likable. They liked each other. You know, 1 Peter 3, verse 8 says this. Finally, all of you, worship team, you can come back up. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other. Notice this. Imagine if we did this in 2020, in the time we live in. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted. Keep your heart tender. Listen, it's easy for your heart to get hard right now when you look around and you see everything. When you hear what people say, when you hear the... All, when you watch the news, it's easy to, for your heart to get hard. Can I tell you, listen, church, you gotta, you got to stay on your knees and keep your heart tender during these times and keep a humble attitude. How many, you know, I, I saw a post on Facebook from somebody I went to high school with. I thought it was kind of funny because I thought, well, I fit in that category. But, but they said, you know, it's amazing that all these doctors and scientists are saying one thing about masks. I know this is a hot topic, but they're all saying one thing. She said, and then yet the people that I went to high school with that barely got it, got through science, say something completely different. She said, hmm, I wonder who I'm going to listen to. And I thought, yeah, I was one of those guys that, that barely made it through science. And so anyway, how, how many know I'm not a scientist, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but I just want to keep a humble attitude? Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't. I mean, the one thing I have figured out through this whole COVID-19 is there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know, and I, I think there's a lot of bunch of people who don't know a lot of people who don't they just we just don't know we're just humble enough to say i don't know go on to the next one if you could don't repay evil for evil facebook just just saying it don't repay you don't retaliate with insults when people insult you man that's hard to do because i'm good man i am good at comebacks <laughs> I mean, I can cut you down so quick. <laughs> it's a gift. But uh, anyway, it says, but I got to keep it under control. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Whew. Wow. He goes on and he says, uh, that's what God called you to do. If you'll live that way, he'll grant you his blessing. He says, if you want to really enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and watch this and work to maintain it. It is hard to keep peace. But when we do, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and his ears are open to their prayers. How many of you want your prayers to just go right to heaven? Listen, stay humble, be kind. Seek peace, work to maintain it. And so we, we add value to people, we value people. Listen, here's the third thing, show your faith. People need to see your faith. Take, take Jesus to the marketplace with you and when you have a problem, invite him in. Y'all remember what Jesus' first miracle was? Remember where it was? It wasn't at a church wasn't in a church service. It wasn't even a healing or a raising somebody from the dead. His first miracle was he was at a wedding ceremony and they ran out of wine. And, and his mom comes to him. He's like, you're not going to believe it. I mean, think about that. Why was the very first miracle he did at a wedding ceremony, and it doesn't even seem like a big deal. I mean, Jesus could have said, you know what? I think they've had enough anyway. But he didn't do that. He, <laughs> he said, it's about to get crazy up in here. But anyway, he, <laughs> his very first miracle was turning water into wine. And I believe that he was showing us, listen, I, I'm interested in every aspect of your life. And I'm not just for Sunday mornings, but I'm for every problem that you have. And if you'll invite me into every situation 
that I, that I can not only meet you at church, but I can, I can meet every problem. And so throughout the day, when you have a problem, listen, uh, write this verse down. Write down Philippians 2. I'm sorry, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do you have that? Did I give you that? Yeah. Notice these words. Be anxious for what? Nothing. And, and so the minute you start to feel worry come on, you're at work or you're someplace and you just found out, hey, you're, 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 you're about to, you know, we're handing out pink slips today. Or the doctor says, you know, I'm going to need you to come back because that last report didn't look good. This is the scripture. This is your go-to, everybody. You need to memorize this one because it says, be anxious for what? Don't, don't worry about anything, nothing at all. But in everything, pray with what? Thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now notice this, here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. So here it is, you're at work. You get the bad, I'm going to, this is how you become a 24-7 Christian right here. You get bad news. Your, your first response is, oh my God, oh my God, I, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lo- we're going to lose everything. This is, uh, your mind begins to go to the worst possible place. I know I'm one of the ones who's going to get cut. I know this. Nobody's going to hire me in this time. Look at me. I'm almost 50. And, and you start going through all these things. And then you remember this scripture and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. God, you told me. Here's how you do it, everybody. Get alone. God, you told me not to be anxious. Lord, I'm feeling anxious right now, but you told me not to. You told me to pray. And you said to do it with thanksgiving. So God, I thank you. I thank you that I can pray. I thank you that I have God. I thank you you've never failed me, never left me. God, thank you for that. Now God, please help me here. Help me. Let me be one of the ones that don't lose their job, God. You know, I I, I tithe. You'd miss the tithe, wouldn't you, oh God? I, I need that, Lord. That's my request. But... Whatever happens, Lord, give me your peace. That passes all understanding so that when I go through the same thing that everybody else does, they'll look to me and say, how in the world can you have peace right now? And You can show them your faith. So when they ask the question, how can you have peace right now? Well, God just wired me that way. I'm strong, you know. I'm strong. Yeah, if my daddy was strong, I'm strong. We just, we know how to pull our boots up by our bootstraps. That's all I'm saying right now. No, when they say, how, how are you doing this right now? Listen, you just look at them and say, you know, I don't know how you do it without the Lord. And listen, you can have the same peace that I have. When... When people that you meet, listen, people, there's, there's open doors. If you begin to pray, God, open doors around me. And then begin to look for open doors and be sensitive. People are setting you up to share the gospel all the time. We don't have to set a Saturday for everybody to go out and share their faith. Those things are amazing. But I can just tell you that people are giving you open doors all the time if we'll be aware. When they start to tell you how bad their marriage is, man, my, my marriage is terrible. I wish I had a marriage like yours. Really? Yeah, well, let me, let me tell you what. My, my marriage isn't so great either. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about somebody else. <laughs> you can, it, it, it can go one way or the other. You know what? My marriage isn't so great either. We're having some real problems right now. Are you kidding me? But you're so happy. You're so joyful. You, you have such peace. Well, yeah, you know what? But I, I couldn't have that if it wasn't for the Lord. I don't know how you do it without the Lord. I really don't know how, you, how you're doing it. Or, or maybe it's like Becky and I, it's like, man, you guys, you guys seem to have the perfect marriage. It, it seems so good. Well, I'll tell you what, it's hard work. You just got to work at it. We can answer like that, which is true. Or we can tell them the rest of the story, which is, you know what, it didn't start out that great. First couple years were kind of rough until we began to do it God's way. And once we began to do it God's way, Everything changed. And can I just tell you, now that we've been doing it God's way, it just keeps getting better and better and better. He'll do the same for you. We're not that great. We just got a great God. And just like he's helped us, he'll help you too. Do you see how easy it is to share your faith if we just has eyes? And then we begin to wrap our story. That's the other thing that 
says in 1 Peter 3. He says, worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about the hope, about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain. Someone looks at you and says, how can you have hope in these crazy times? How, how are you not falling apart? Just wrap your story around the gospel. Tell them your failures. People love to hear about how you messed up. Got a young lady right now, and I really am closing. Got a young lady right now who's going through a terrible time, the, the trial of her life, probably the worst trial that she will ever go through. Can't imagine things getting any worse than that. Our family has added value to her for years. We've shared our faith with her for years. And it's just kind of always put it off, put it off, put it off. And she went through a tragedy recently, and um, we reached out to her. And now she's very, very, very receptive. And, but as I was sharing with her about how she needs the Lord, I also had to let her know that, look, you know, what you see is, is like the end product. You, you didn't see me when I was messed up. You, you didn't know the, the you know, I know you don't feel worthy, but listen, if you knew who I was, I haven't always been a preacher, everybody. If you knew who I was, you would realize that the God we serve, he rescues, he redeems, he restores. And just like he saved me and you see what he, how he's changed my life, he will do the same for you. So listen, here's your homework. This message really isn't about us, is it? It's about those who aren't here. It's about the empty seats. And those who need Jesus. And so here's what I want you to do, everybody. I want you to just start a list. Just start a list. How many of you know one person who's not saved? Raise your hand. You know one person who's not saved? A family member, somebody... And I just want you to start a list. Your goal is to get 10 people on the list. People who, don't, who need Jesus. They just need Jesus. And you begin to pray for them every day. Just pray for that list every day. And then you say, God, give me an open door. Somehow open the door for me to share my faith with them. That's it. And then watch what God does. And then just tell them about Jesus. You know, if we all did that and led one person to Jesus, you know our church would double? Just like that. No, you don't have to spend any money. Just We just, every one of us lead somebody to Jesus this year. That doesn't sound hard, does it? One person this year? Listen, just get that person in your mind right now. Say, well, Pastor Troy, I don't know what to say. Just give him, tell him what he did for you. Brandon, Brandon in the house. Hey, come up here. Brandon's great at sharing the gospel. Come up here and share the gospel and then just listen. Instead of y'all thinking, oh, I've heard this, I've heard this a hundred times because we basically say the same thing every time. This time you're going to listen and you're going to think, I, I, got, I better listen because I'm going to share what he just shared with other people. So, And then we're going we're gonna to sing after that. Is that all right? All right. I didn't know that was coming. Um, yeah, before we start the worship at the end, um, God really put it on my heart. When I was 16 years old, um, I sat in church, you know, and I, I participated and I checked the box and I done everything that looked right. Um, but at 16 years old, I believed that I was, I was probably lost. I was filled with religion uh, and I didn't know um, my Savior. Um, I looked at it as I needed hell insurance. I was scared half to death to go to hell. And then I heard um, Pastor Troy sent me a podcast on John Maxwell, and he said these exact words, and it really um, happened to me at 21. But he said he was speaking with someone, and, and the person said, I can't believe in a God that would take you to hell. And he said, oh, oh, that's not my God. He said, my God laid down where you have to step over him to go your choice 
And when I started thinking about that at 21 years old, I got in a terrible jet ski accident. And guys, I didn't know what was going on. I was passed out in the water and my, my friend pulled me out of the water and got me back to his lake house. And we jumped in his truck and I didn't come to until we got to his truck. I knew that something was wrong with my shoulder. I didn't know if I had internal bleeding, brain damage. I didn't know what happened. But I asked God right there. I just felt an overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit. And I said, God, and this is cheap, I get it. But I said, God, if you will save me today, if you will rescue me with just a broken shoulder, I will not only give my life to you, but I will die for you. I will confess it everywhere I go. And if you will equip me, if you will give me the power of the Holy Spirit, I will tell the world about you. Right there in that truck is when I, I realized, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteous in God. And so today, it's if you are here and you don't know Jesus, it comes down to just admitting that we, we fall short. Romans 10.9.10 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. So I still am working out my salvation. Am I saved? Absolutely. Am I going to heaven? By the grace of God and me putting faith in him. But daily I'm proclaiming the good news and what he's done for my life. Church, let's not allow the cross to get old news. It is fresh. It is updated. And he is still laying there. And if you, if you are willing to step over, then that is by choice. But our God has laid down for our sins. He's that God. And so today, if we could have every eye closed and every head bowed before we start worshiping, I'm not even going to make you raise your hand. I just want you to know that we're here for you, and we want to help you on your journey. And if that's you today, and you don't know whether you, you have a relationship with God, you don't know, it's not secure, today, let it, let it be today. And, and it comes down to just admitting that we're a sinner. It comes down to believing in God the Father raised the Son from the dead. That He rose again for our sins. And it's by confessing it. Repenting from our old self and confessing it. If that's you today, when we close this service, I'm going to stand up here. I would love to talk to you. I'd love to tell you more of my story. But our God is that God. He's laid down. And, and the Holy Spirit is talking to some of you this morning so Father God we come to you and I praise you for this church God I praise you for each and each and every individual soul here God God I ask that you bless them but right now Holy Spirit I ask that you do a work in our heart whether that's coming to know you for the first time or God you doing a deeper work a deeper connection in us and I ask that Holy Spirit that you will equip your people here, God. I ask that you fill them with yourself, God, that we can go through Princeton, through Marion, through Western Kentucky, through the states and to the end of the world, God. We praise you, Lord. We see that there's a, a lost and hurting war, uh, world, God, and we ask in the name of Jesus, God, that you will empower us to touch souls today, God, that we will step out of here and be the church that you've called us to be, Lord. God, we ask that you fall on us, that your presence will fall right now, Lord, that we can feel you and have an encounter in you that we might not have had, Lord. We praise you, God. We give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
Father God, I pray that your peace, that you would guard our hearts, guard our minds in these troubled times with your, with your peace. God, I pray that you give us unshakable faith in shaky times. God, I pray that we can be light and salt in this world. Let us make hung, people hungry for you. Go with us as we go. God, let your spirit go. God, be with your people. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Hope you have a great week. Don't forget to uh, give your tithes and offerings as you leave. God bless you.